Hello, um, welcome to this year's panel of the Young Scholar Award um, of the European Data Protection Law Review. And like every year, we are very happy to present the three winners of this year's award. Um, they were chosen by a jury of four members of the editorial board of the EDPL. Um, first, by Gloria gonzalez Fasta, who's a research professor at the University of Brussels, um, who can't join us today because she um, is in another panel, but um, Hilke Hiemans will join us. He's the director of the Belgian Data Protection Authority and an academic. And Alessandro Spina is also a member of the jury. Um, he's at the legal service of the European Commission. And I was also part of the jury myself. I'm a professor of KIT and my name is Francisca Böhm and uh, Fitz Karlsruhe. And although I have to say that this year was a bit different regarding the procedure and the amount of papers handed in, um, we received very good submissions and we uh, selected the three best ones, uh, which are now presented uh, by the authors of these papers. And uh, topics relate to three important research questions surrounding purpose limitation, genetic data, and the right to access in a law enforcement context. And we will structure the panel as uh, follows. Um, each paper will be presented by the author, him or herself, for 10 minutes in form of a PowerPoint presentation. And before the presentation, the paper will be very shortly introduced by one of the reviewers saying a few words why this paper was selected. In the end of the presentation of the author, you, so the public, is invited um, to ask questions via the chat function you can see on the right side of your screen. And please make use of that and ask questions to the authors because this <laughs> will really help us um, to get on a nice uh, chat. Um, and we will have 20 minutes per presentation. And in the end, our dear editor Bart van der Stolt from Tilburg University will announce uh, the winner and the prize. And now we will start with Alessandro Spina from the jury introducing Isabel Hahn's paper. Yes, hi everyone. I hope you can uh, hear me. Uh, the jury has appreciated uh, very much this submission uh, because it touches upon a key contemporary challenge, not only for privacy and data protection law, but for society and civil rights uh, at large. How to deal with that form of data power that others might call uh, informational power, platform power, which basically implies that in the hands of few economic operators, uh, we find a concentration of technical capacity, which enables them uh, to, uh, to affect the uh, uh, civil rights, uh, our participation to public life, our access to information, etc. Um, we can remind that uh, there is been already some studies uh, on this new form of power, which is uh, more of a manipulative nature rather than a coercive nature. And I refer here, for example, at the study of 2000 made by Orlan Liski, uh, grappling with data power, normative nudges uh, from data protection and privacy. And all these studies have tried to tackle this new form of power uh, in order to understand its implication. Now, what this submission and the very peculiar and attractive uh, uh, element of this mission is that the paper invites to a reflection on how the principle of purpose limitation, a classic data protection principle, which uh, is, is, is been uh, intrinsic to uh, data protection since the very beginning, uh, provides a possibility to uh, as a sort of checks and balance to limit the form of data power. And, and this invites us also to reflect to, about the importance of this principle, in particular, as there are a lot of, uh, of uh, opinions uh, that uh, militate in favor of its uh, demise from data protection. So without taking uh, much uh, attention, I give the floor to Isabel for the presentation. 
adaptation of their, of their paper. Um, well, thank you very much for the wonderful introduction. First and foremost, I would like to say thank you to EDPL, of course, and to CPDP for having me today. Um, my name is Isabel. I am currently a legal trainee at NOIB, and today I will be presenting for you a paper that I wrote based on my undergraduate dissertation at the London School of Economics titled Purpose Limitation in the Time of Data Power. Is there a way forward? So in my paper, um, as already briefly mentioned, I explore two concepts. On the one hand, I look at the purpose limitation principle, and on the other hand, I look at practices by what's known as data power companies. And I look at how these two principles interact, or these two concepts interact. I look at the juxtapositions that arise, the inherent tensions between them, and whether or not there is a way to resolve the tension, um, which I think is a, a hotly debated question. So I'll begin briefly by speaking about this concept of data power. Um, it's a concept or a term that's probably familiar to the most of you. Some of you might think of tech giants that are dominant, um, that collect, store, and aggregate data. Um, but what I do in my paper is I zoom into a more narrow definition that is offered by Linsky, which in particular touches upon the concentration of large volumes of data of different varieties in the hands of private economic entities. And it is the control over this data that is decisive to this power. It is the control over the data that poses regulatory issues that I think are worthy of exploration. And so I define and look at three different features that contribute to the creation of data power. The first is omnipresence of a company in the digital environment. The second is the large volume and variety of data it has. And the third is the company's ability to aggregate this data across different data sets. And so when these three features come together, often what we see with relation to companies that possess data power, such as Google or Facebook, is we see a norm of data access in which data is collected for many different purposes um, that are often vague and unspecified. And this, unfortunately, leads to a reality in which some may think that the purpose limitation principle is not being respected. And the purpose limitation principle is found under Article 5.1b of the GDPR and stipulates that personal data shall be collected for specified, explicit, and legitimate purposes and not further processed in a manner that is incompatible with those purposes. So I divide this principle into two limbs. The first limb focuses on purpose specification, so that data must be collected for a specified, explicit, and legitimate purpose. And the second limb focuses on compatible use, so whether or not it can be further processed. And the argument that I make is that one can hardly speak of compatible use, one can hardly evaluate whether a purpose is compatible without being able to further define an initial purpose. So if there is no explicit, specific, and legitimate purpose to begin with, one cannot really begin to speak of compatible use. And so I think it's particularly this, this notion that a purpose must be specified, explicit, and legitimate that poses issues with regards to the practices by data power companies. And I think that's where you really see an inherent tension that arises between the two concepts. Because on the one hand, you have companies that are collecting data, that are repurposing it, that are combining it and aggregating it across data sets, across their own services. And on the other hand, you have this cornerstone of data protection law that is advocating for exactly the opposite. And it's advocating for the fact that data and purposes are specifically defined, that they're made clear to the user. And a lot of academic discussion focuses on whether those two principles are inherently incompatible. And so while some may think so, I offer a couple of arguments in my paper for why they actually should remain side by side and why purpose and limitation plays a fundamental role in safeguarding both the individual and also preventing the further buildup of informational power in the hands of such companies, and therefore think that its role should not be diminished, especially in light of the changing practices that data power companies engage in. 
And the other thing I discuss in my paper is the lack of enforcement of this principle with regards to both national data protection authorities and also its lack of mention in the case law. And I think one issue that we see here is that because of this lack of enforcement, there has not been an incentive for these data power companies to change the way that they collect data. There has not been an incentive for them to rethink their purposes that they present to the user. And so what I do after that is I look at a normative theory um, of privacy and try and understand whether or not that can be used as an argument for stricter enforcement. And so the theory that I explore is known as contextual integrity, presented um, a, a theory originally presented by Helen Nissenbaum in her book, Privacy in Context. And the theory of contextual integrity seeks to determine when a violation of privacy has occurred through the contextual evaluation of norms related to information sharing. And it stipulates that a violation of privacy or data protection has occurred when the informational norms in a context have been violated. And so I explore this theory and try and build up a framework through which one can argue that the purpose limitation principle should be strictly enforced, especially against companies with data power, precisely because of the way in which it violates informational norms in a particular context. Um, and I think it can also be used as an argument through which to justify deviating from the one-size-fits-all approach that we might commonly find under the GDPR to warrant an increased um, imposition of controller obligations on companies with such data power. Um, and I think in particular, the second notion is something that we're actually beginning to see in a broader landscape. Um, we're seeing it not only in the data protection landscape, but also um, slowly shifting towards it in the competition law sense, in the market and economic sense. And I think a good example of this is the Digital Markets Act, which came out a couple of weeks ago, which um, imposes specific obligations on gatekeepers because it explicitly recognizes the way that it in the way that such gatekeepers can impact both users and a competition. And so in answering the question of whether there is a way forward in relation to the purpose limitation principle in the time of data power, I conclude by saying, yes, there is, that we should not undermine the fundamental safeguards which purpose limitation seeks to further, and also the way in which it seeks to prevent a further buildup of data power in the hands of such companies, and that therefore, there should be a call for stricter enforcement that should be explored. So in brief, that's a very short summary of my paper. Um, thank you all for listening and I invite any questions should you have them. Thank you, Isabel. I think um, you know, understand why we selected this paper. I think it's a very good presentation. Thanks, Isabel. Very informative. So um, please, if, if you have questions, I'm sorry that I'm looking to my left because I have to keep uh, track of the chat. Um, and um, please ask your questions if you have them in the chat. So the reason why I'm looking uh, to my left for you is because I have to read the chat. So if there are any questions, please ask them now um, to, to the authors. And otherwise, we will start asking questions of the jury. And this might not be <laughs> very and nice. And so I'm, I'm waiting for a question. If no question comes in, maybe I can I can start with the question. Oh, Alessandro, do you have a question? Maybe because you are the first reviewer. Yeah. yeah, I have a just a question for me is about the difference between informational power and data power. So you point out that the key issue is about control over the data, which for me, it's what we understand as data power. However, what in the, in the framework of informational power held by certain companies, we see the possibility for these entities to leverage on this power, even without a control of the data, even without processing the data. For example, uh, exploiting the cognitive value of this data, which are normally processed for other purposes, and whose, that, that allows certain inferences or certain cognitive surplus 
which is then used by the companies in order to um, to, 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 to provide certain services. So I just wanted uh, to, to ask you whether in terms of refining the concept of data power, you, you would see such a nuance uh, uh, to, to be established. Thank you for the question, Alessandro. And I think it is in fact um, a very good point that you touch upon, especially in light of the fact that there are multiple terms um, that are often used. You have informational power, as you said, um, which I believe the Competition Markets Authority has also used. You have data power, you have platform power, you have gatekeeper power. And while they all point to similar things, I think what kind of sets data power apart, um, as you've briefly mentioned, is this control over data, is the ability to, to aggregate the data, to be able to repurpose it, um, and to be able to, as you've rightfully acknowledge, leverage it in a way that creates an informational asymmetry between the user and the company. And I think informational power is also similar in that sense. I think it too very well expresses um, what data power tries to capture in the sense that there are cognitive um, things that can be exploited when it comes to users, especially when they're profiled, especially when they are then targeted based on inferences that are drawn from the data. Um, and I think what is important about these terms, what they all elicit is the fact that there is an issue here. And so whether we choose to, 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 to label the term data power or informational power or gatekeeper power, um, they all speak to the broader issue at play, which is that such companies, such power does have a disproportionate on, uh, effect on the user and especially on their right to data protection which is something that I believe can not really be ignored um, because of the damaging consequences that it can have on the user. Thanks, Isabel. I think we have a, one question of Christiana Santos, and she says that such an important analysis so true that purposes need auditing and enforcement. I'm curious about your common purposes not defined. Mostly they are defined, though they are not specified or explicit. Um, which purposes have you analyzed to bring this impacting conclusion and a very nice uh, presentation? Congratulations. Thank you very much, uh, Christiana, for the question. Um, and I must say, actually, I too was listening to the panel, um, which Christiana spoke at yesterday also on a similar topic. and. Um, one of the purposes that was pointed out there in relation to IAB Europe's framework um, was kind of this common purpose that is often used by companies of just uh, collecting and improving their services. So just marketing and improvement of services. And I think um, there were a couple of other um, purposes that were listed in that excellent paper, um, which was also produced, which I encourage everyone to go read. But in terms of what such purposes I've come across myself, one must only check, for example, the cookie banner of a company to see how vague purposes may be. Um, but, you know, we use this to market your data. We use this to develop our products and services. We use this in a way that will be further specified. I think it is very hard to find an example nowadays of a purpose that has been clearly defined in a way that it is intelligible to the user, explicitly defined, and also legitimate. And so I think that this is unfortunate. And I think that while it is something that is widespread, it is something that is definitely worthy of further attention in order to be able to adequately tackle it. Uh, thank you, Isabel. Um, as I, I don't see another question so far in the chat, um, I um, dare to ask one by myself. And just, you talk a lot about a lack of enforcement. And maybe you can tell us a bit on how you imagine how can that be enforced? Because I think it's it's very difficult for DPAs to do that. And maybe you have some ideas um, which go a bit further about the, the enforcement issue. Um, that's an excellent question. And I think, unfortunately, lack of enforcement is not just something that is relevant to purpose limitation, but probably permeates through a lot of the other principles that we see in the GDPR. And I think specifically with regards to purpose limitation, um, it's a shame that a lot of the complaints that we see submitted to national data protection authorities concern the rights of the data subject, which are more are very important, but leave fundamental values and fundamental um, 
principles, should I more accurately say, that are found, found under Article 5 of the GDPR is something that is secondary to the rights of the data subject. And so I think one key way in which enforcement could be improved would be to actually bring these principles to the forefront, bring them to the center of the discussion, and actually issue fines or issue issue measures that relate to them as opposed to only having them be touched upon towards the end of a discussion or towards the end of a complaint or in order to, to strengthen another point. Um, an example that that comes to the top of my head is Knuel's investigation of, of Google in 2012, where Google combined the privacy policies it had from across 60 different services into one in order to be able to aggregate their data. Um, and when Knuel investigated this, it turned into a discussion about the principle of, of fair information under back then the data protection directive. Um, when in question, when in reality, what should have been discussed, in my opinion, was whether or not Google was allowed to aggregate these data sets and allowed to combine the purposes which they present to the user. But instead of it being a discussion based on purpose limitation and a discussion about whether Google should be allowed to combine these data sets, it turned into a discussion where this rights to combine was taken as a granted, as take was taken for granted as long as the combination was done in a fair and transparent manner. And so I think to answer your question specifically, one way in which enforcement can be improved with regards to this particular principle is to really hit the nail on the head and to examine it and to discuss it in more depth as a primary issue as opposed to a secondary one. Thank you, Isabel. We have one. Uh, we have time for one question left, and I think that it's the question of Mark, um, who asks ask, It's an interesting presentation, so thanks. Um, but who should decide the limits of the future purposes? Do we really want um, an overburdened regulator to also be burdened with auditing the repurposing of data? So I think it's a very valid question, Isabel. <laughs> I agree. It is a very valid question. And it is obviously difficult to strike a balance. Um, one suggestion that was made during a panel yesterday was that DPA should be in charge of presenting a list of purposes that are explicit, specific, legitimate, well-defined, that companies can then use as an example. But obviously that places a, a burden on the regulator as well. And so I think... It is a difficult question. I think there are varying opinions to this, but I do think that a balance needs to be struck. On the one hand, between DPAs looking into this more, they might not need to be the ones that reevaluate the purposes, but they do need to engage in a proper and textured discussion and exploration of the purposes. And on the other hand, a balance between companies, for instance, that might have data power, in actually being more transparent with their purposes and being more forthcoming with their purposes, but also in being held or being able to be held accountable for when they fail to do this. And I think accountability really is key here. And I think accountability is something that can be promoted and enforced by the data protection authorities. So while potentially some may argue that they need not must they must not go as far as as being the ones who constantly reevaluate and and control these purposes i do think that data protection authorities have a role to play when it comes to holding companies accountable for the purposes which they present to their users thank thank you isabel um i think um we the public now understands why we selected this paper. Now we come to the uh, second paper. Thank you, Alessandro, as well, and Isabel. Um, and now you. we come right. to the second paper we selected for this year's um, award. Um, one of the winners, um, it is from Tana Kuru, Genetic Data, the Achilles Heel of the GDPR. And um, we select this paper to be one of the winners because it is yeah, discussed a very relevant and current question. Um, it is about the protection of genetic groups through the GDPR and how these groups are or even are not protected. And it presents some ideas relating to data protection impact assessments and remedies and concludes that these groups are not sufficiently protected. 
and the paper is very insightful and reaches substantial conclusion, conclusions. Um, these could be, however, maybe a bit better developed, but um, it invites a very important discussion and it was overall seen very positively by the jury. And now I invite uh, the author himself, uh, Tana Kuro, to pre uh, present his paper. Um, thank you very much. And um, thank you for the introduction. And today I am presenting, as stated, my article um, based on my thesis I submitted last year during my studies at Leiden University. And um, I believe everyone in this room has heard about genetic testing companies so far. And or some of you might have even um, shared your genetic material with research institutions trying to understand why some people suffer more from um, COVID-19 nowadays. Or you may have seen news articles um, around the world, law enforcement agencies uh, finding criminals they've been looking for decades through familial DNA uh, searching. Of course, processing uh, genetic data raises several privacy concerns in all these domains. But one thing makes genetic data quite extraordinary here, because when researchers look into your genes, it doesn't reveal only information about yourself, but also about other individuals with whom you share genetic similarity with. However, these people, which from this point on I will uh, refer as members of genetic groups, they do not even know that your common genetic data is being processed. So this made me question how we can protect members of genetic groups against any infringements. And in my research, I examined whether the GDPR provides any protection for members of genetic groups. And I first concluded some members of genetic groups could be regarded as data subjects individually due to the broad interpretation of personal data notion, which says that information could be relating to an individual by its content, purpose or impact. For example, when your sister's genetic data reveals information about your genetic disorders, her data is relating to you by its content. Or when law enforcement officers find your data in the crime scene and analyze your sister's genetic data to identify any kinship between you two, processing her genetic data is relating to you by its purpose. And lastly, let's assume that you are a pilot and your sister has shared her genetic testing results, revealing she carries the gene responsible for Huntington disease with the same company. Then your employer might ask you to be deployed in a non-flight position, which would make processing of your sister's genetic data here relating to you by its impact. After this, I checked whether members of genetic groups are identifiable from this common genetic data. Since the genetic data itself does not reveal precisely the identity of any other members of genetic groups as a standalone, our main focus should be here the identifiable criterion. And research evidence that even if you have not shared your genetic data with anyone ever before, it is actually possible to identify you if enough of your relatives had done so. And considering this and the broad understanding on the identi identifiability under Article 4 and Recital 26, we should accept that members of genetic groups are indeed identifiable through common genetic data. However, the mere hypothetical possibility is not enough to satisfy this criterion and there should be legal means to identify someone from this data. But such means could easily arise in various instances when we process genetic data, for instance, through a warrant. And uh, for ex um, as we have seen some, yeah, as we have seen some members of genetic groups could be considered as data subjects and making the GDPR as the law of everybody, so to say. Uh, I realized that consequences of this interpretation might lead to crucial functionality problems for the GDPR. First of all, to protect your rights and interests, you need to know that such rights and interests exist. However, members of genetic groups might not be informed about their rights or even their status as being data subjects because Article 14 provides an excessive list of exemptions for data controllers to circumvent uh, obligation to provide information to these people. This causes an invisible processing which prevents members of genetic groups from enjoying their rights, even in cases of a data breach. So besides, I identified another crucial issue here. First, for example, when your relatives share their genetic data with a genetic testing company, they should provide their explicit consent, right? But when we also identify you as a data subject here, 
what is the legal basis to process your data here? Because you didn't provide your consent, the processing was not foreseeable for you, so maybe there's no legal basis for you here at all then. We then conclude maybe uh, hundreds of data controllers around the world have been processing European genetic data illegally. And if so, maybe we should call for a moratorium or on genetic research until we find a clear legal basis for this processing. But of course, such outcomes would be a clear contradiction with the telos of the GDPR and the objectives of the EU itself. So, in the end, it is safe to say that this interpretation causes a system overload, as Prutova puts it, and because it expands the scope of the GDPR to the extent that it causes ambiguous and contradictory outcomes. And maybe this is because too much is expected from regulating everything within a single framework of law in the books, as Coops puts it. So therefore, I believe we need to look into this issue through the lens of teleological interpretation by analyzing the underlying purposes and the objectives of the GDPR. Deriving from this approach, I argue that members of genetic groups cannot be regarded as data subjects for three main reasons. First of all, the GDPR takes the individual data subject as the focal point to whom the obligations should be fulfilled. This approach prevents the recognition of groups as data subjects, unlike some scholars argue. Second, with the very definition of the GDPR itself, in the relevant uh, provisions in GDPR, the European legislator intentionally or unintentionally directly refers to the individuals who share their genetic material as data subjects. So this also prevents recognition of other members of genetic groups when their common data, uh, common genetic data is processed as data subjects. And lastly, this approach could also be justified by the functionality of the GDPR, because indeed the Russian personae is an essential element for the functionality of GDPR, but it is nearly impossible for any data controller to identify precisely the re uh, related data subjects before or even after they process genetic data. So, okay, we say members of genetic groups cannot be regarded as data subject, but is there any other way to protect these people within the GDPR? To find an answer to this, I first analyzed the DPIA processes because some scholars argue that genetic groups should be considered in this process since Article 35 refers to natural persons. However, when we, realize, uh, when we analyze this article in connection with Recital 39 and Article 35.7c, it is clear that the GDPR uses the terms natural persons and data subjects here intertwined, leading the exclusion of members of genetic groups from the primary consideration. But even if we accept that genetic groups should be considered in this process, I believe the downfall of this interpretation will be the lack of active participation of these people uh, here. And of course, there is a room for considering genetic groups in DPIA processes regardless of their status, as Article 35.7d requires data controllers to consider other persons' rights and interests than data subjects. But here, the GDPR stays silent on the scope and the extent of this consideration, and most importantly, what to do when other persons' rights and interests prevail over the ones of data subjects. And Lastly, I analyze whether members of genetic groups could seek compensation in case of a breach through Article 82, because it says any person may do so. However, when I apply it again, the systematic interpretation here, uh, we, as I did for the DPIA uh, processes, um, I see that the European legislature again here uh, means data subjects with the term any person and leaving members of genetic groups in a vulnerable position, even in case of an infringement. And summarizing my research, yes, some members of genetic groups could be pr protected via GDPR by recognizing individually them as data subjects. However, such interpretation results in contradictory and ambiguous outcomes that GDPR clearly falls short of answering as it stands. Besides, I believe that members of genet genetic groups cannot be regarded as data subjects either individually or as a group, as it is clearly contradicts contradicting with the telos of the GDPR. So lastly, it is also very hard to uh, provide full and effective protection for genetic groups through the provisions that might potentially protect individuals other than data subjects, as I explained. So of course, this is all about how we interpret um, the GDPR and 
it is yet to be seen how, for example, the CJU would handle such a case. But I think one thing is for sure here, and that is until we understand if and how we can protect genetic groups within GDPR, genetic data continue to pose a serious threat that can rock the GDPR to its foundations and continue to being the Achilles heel of the GDPR, so to say. And with this, I would like to um, finish my presentation here and give the floor back to the moderator. And I would like to thank again to jury members and um, congratulate my fellow uh, finalists for this great achievement. Thank you, Tana. Um, very good presentation as well and um, very informative. And we already have uh, one question uh, coming in. Um, and how the question is from Chris, um, how do you define genetic groups and what are the identifiers for these genetic groups, I think? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you very much. Um, I used in my um, article, also in my thesis, the definition um, uh, provided by uh, Professor Schallen and Deher because uh, they also uh, come up with this definition of genetic groups because when we talk about genetics, we talk about different groups, so to say, because you might be um, attached to a, a, a group of people through your genetics um, with, for instance, kinship. And you, uh, on the other hand, you might be attached to a group of people without being in a kinship, but for instance, through, um, through a genetic, um, uh, the similar genetic architecture, let's say, if you suffer from the same illness. So the genetic groups that uh, therefore um, includes all these perspectives when we talk about uh, genetics and the identification therefore comes in two dimensions. Like first, um, GDPR wise, uh, giving the precise identity of any other person. And also the second part, maybe this is out of the scope of the GDPR, but um, characterizing a group of people that are not uh, per se related with uh, kinship. Thank you, Atana. We have uh, two more questions. And two more questions coming in. And the first one is uh, how, from Nelly, um, how would you propose to defend the rights of members of genetic groups? Because uh, I think this uh, is something you leave open. Yes, I mean, that's the whole point of my article and my argumentation, because this is all about interpretation. And um, there are some ways to, as I explained, especially through broad interpretation or um, interpretation of the other article provisions, for instance, DPIA or right compensation, but all different uh, interpretation methods lead you somewhere else. And even if we say there is a protection for these people, uh, as I explained, it's takes you to a point that it creates some ambiguous and contradictory outcomes that GDPR cannot explain right now. Um, but I believe this is a very, very important and crucial issue because uh, back in 2008 with the marker case, the interests of groups over their common genetic data have been um, introduced, recognized, and uh, they were saying the rapid advancements in genetic sequencing and information, information technologies may have adverse effects on the fundamental rights. And I would like to remind you once again, it was in 2008 and the state of the art of technology is not even comparable what we have today regarding genetic technologies and sequencing technologies. Therefore, I believe this question is a bit overlooked and have various answers, but we don't know how to answer um, those answers are leading us to. Okay, uh, thank you. And there's another question of uh, Christina and the Santos. Uh, very nice. How do you see an explicit consent request in a consent banner? Yeah. How is it different from other banners requesting consent? Yeah, and we already have so many consent banners. So <laughs> how is it different? Yes. Um... Well, explicit consent or like other types of consent, yes, uh, th there are also some research on this in different institutions. But my question then would be, for instance, when we talk about genetic groups, there might be some instances when right to know and right not to know of mem different members of the same genetic group could clash. And here the consent is meaningless because then how we make the, who will make these trade-offs and how we are going to implement it into this consenting process. Because for instance, if uh, 
the overall, the idea of that uh, genetic group is favoring right not to know, but if one individual there would like to know, then would that consent, even though if it's explicit, it's required, uh, it matches with all the tick box, like would then we say this is legal? So it again creates some issues that we still don't know the answer yet. Um, thanks. Thank you. There's one last question, I think. Yeah, we have time. We have four minutes left um, from Mark. Um, I think you are absolutely right in your thinking, even beyond processing grounds. If a member of a genetic group can be identified, then this could result in one data subject exercising data subject rights against a controller that has a legal basis for processing another data subject's data. Would you envisage a data controller denying these rights of one data subject at the expense of another? Yes, I mean, in my article and in my thesis, I argue, because when we talk about here the genetic research and like processing of genetic data, we're actually touching upon some different aspects of like, or different uh, kind of legal basis here. So one solution offer that I uh, pointed out, if we accept the broad interpretation and these people are data subjects, to just prevent the outcomes that are contradicting and uh, they're ambiguous, Maybe I said uh, member states could invoke Article 82 to 80, sorry, 89 to 2, but uh, to prevent some of the um, use, using of some um, rights of data subjects. But this inevitably leads to diversified regimes in Europe. And in a case where we talk about genetic data, where people could be in different jurisdictions by nature, I believe that would inevitably cause some problems regarding access to justice on the same issue. So I still don't know the precise answer for this, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Hi, Tana. Sorry. I think, yeah, yeah I was muted. I'm sorry. I also no have kids at home. Um, so, Tana, thank you very much. Um, I'm really uh, glad that you had this presentation. It was a very good one. And now we come to the next um, and the third, um, let's say, winner of uh, the, this year's award. And um, Hilke Heimans from the Belgium DPA will introduce this paper, which is then followed by Katerin. Thank you very much. Um, it is with pleasure that I read the paper. Um, I found it a very good piece of work in an area which I, I follow for years and for years. Uh, it was very clearly written. It has a good structure and discusses an important issue which, as the author rightly states, is quite often overlooked. The impact of the right to access in the security area, which in that paper explains it quite well, uh, is particularly difficult there because especially in the security area there's all reasons to limit, to restrict the right thing. We do that in the GDPR, things to our, on the basis of Article 23, many member states do that, and in the Law Enforcement Directive, and uh, as well as in the P PNR Directive, one of the things, that the issues mentioned by the author. So I really like to read what, what I what, what I read, it's uh, good to come back now and then to indeed to the to the area of law enforcement. Uh, the directive 2060-680 is of quite some importance, but in the end of the day, uh, we all focus on the GDPR, so we do that quite quite rarely. Uh, I also liked the positive and uh, conclusion, which is important, explaining that there are possibilities to bring that there are good possibilities to counterbalance uh, the, the various uh, interests, security, and, and privacy in an area where the exercise, as I said already, of data subject rights is not always uh, One thing, although I must say I missed, and I really missed it in the paper, that was that one of the measures uh, uh, included in the law enforcement directive and in years before for access in this specific area is the method of so-called indirect the method which exists uh, that you ask the data protection authority to check for you if there are data of you being processed. Uh, 
I think it's a bit of pity. That's the only thing I could say uh, negative about this very, very good paper. I find it a bit of pity that this point was not further, further, further was not addressed. So I would really uh, consider you to, to elaborate the point further. Moreover, and this is my really this positive part, I will come back to. We hope this article will inspire individuals, NGOs, uh, and everyone involved. We have someone of NOIB here as well, who indeed exercise the right to access in the area of, of uh, police and justice, enabling all actors to further develop, develop the right balance between the public interest investigations, which should be secret to a certain extent, and individuals' privacy rights, which, uh, and in a wider sense, I think this is a this is a, an important uh, uh, study that needs to be done, an important uh, uh, way of challenging data protection law and data protection authorities on the questions between, on the one hand, opaqueness, which might be needed, and on the other hand, transparency to the data. And I think transparency to the data is one of the main issues of the, of the, uh, of the data protection law. That's why I'm happy to see someone of Neub in my, in my, on my screen and hope that that's also maybe an area where you could maybe put some energy. Not the, the issues, problems are not only with the big tech companies. Uh, I think I would like to praise you for your work and I'm, hope, and I'm sure that you will uh, uh, do this in a, in, 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 and I'm sure that you will uh, explain your story in a bit more elaborate way now in the, in the coming minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Catherine, and uh, good luck with your work. Thank you very much, Hilke. Thank you for that kind introduction uh, of my paper. Also, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for being here uh, and for this opportunity to discuss my research with you. And also thanks to EDPL and CPDP for organizing this award and this panel, of course. Um, what I would like to do today is to fill you in on the right of access in a security context and its potential impact in the balance between security and fundamental rights. The motivation behind my work is basically um, we all know we need more transparency from controllers, which in a um, law enforcement context or in a security context is basically competent authorities. So there's a large information asymmetry between, on the one hand, what data controllers know about us and what they are doing with our data. And on the other hand, what we know about their data processing practices. And this is particularly the case in a security context, given the secrecy that these activities tend to involve. So which tools can we use to better understand how our data are being processed and verify that controllers stick to the rules during their processing activities? Well, that's where the right of access comes into play. My paper, is, uh, which is based on my master's thesis at KU Leuven, is an attempt to determine um, to what extent or, or what's the impact of the right of access in the balance between security and fundamental rights. To that end, I first reviewed some literature about the balancing question and the role of data of personal data protection in that regard. Secondly, I looked into the data protection rules in the Law Enforcement Directive and the Passenger Name Record Directive or PNR Directive as two of the legal, the legal instruments that regulate the processing of data in security. And finally, I examined the right of access in the two directives that I studied. With that, I was able to assess to what extent um, can the right of access under the law enforcement directive and the PNR directive be instrumental to the information empowerment of citizens and in this way help mitigate information asymmetries in security. We will come to the results of that assessment in a minute, but before we get there, let me briefly uh, refer to the limitation of fundamental rights for security purposes. And this is a good moment to say that when talking about security, what I mean is the mandate of competent authorities for the fight against crime and terrorism, which is basically what the Law Enforcement Directive and the PNR Directive revolve around. Now, for the state to fulfill one of its most basic functions, that of security, it needs to interfere with fundamental rights from time to time. 
And this, uh, the typical example of this, uh, or the easy example, is uh, when police wiretap our phone communications during a crime investigation. But those limitations to fundamental rights have to be uh, compatible with the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which uh, specifies the conditions to, to do so, to interfere with those rights. But I'm going to skip this because uh, we are short of time. So um, this brings us to the balance part. Uh, protecting the public from uh, legitimate security concerns while protecting uh, at the same time or safeguarding fundamental rights involves a careful balance and it has recently become uh, a more complex exercise given uh, the contemporary data processing practices. As the saying goes, knowledge is power, but perhaps it is time to adapt, that, uh, uh, adapt to the digital age or the information age by saying that actually data is power because the massive exploitation of data gives controllers uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, some informational uh, power in a way. In other words, the exponential increase of data available, coupled with state reliance on advanced technology, could give rise uh, to power asymmetries. So um, what I'm trying to say is that a balance must be struck between security and fundamental rights, and we need to bring informational power into that debate. The data protection rules in the Law Enforcement Directive and the PNR Directive aim to tackle these and related issues. These two instruments facilitate the processing and exchange of personal data for the fight against crime and terrorism, while including safeguards for the protection of fundamental rights, in particular, the rights to privacy and data protection. They also provide individuals uh, with certain rights, including the right of access. We can find the right of access in Article 14 of the Law Enforcement Directive and also in the PNR Directive by operation of its data protection provision, that is Article 13, which refers back to the Law Enforcement Directive, basically. So according to the Law Enforcement Directive and the PNR Directive, you have the right to obtain from competent authorities confirmation as to whether or not personal data concerning you are being processed, and where that's the case, you are entitled to some additional information, including uh, the purposes of and legal basis for the processing, the categories of, data, of personal data concerned, and the recipients to whom the personal data have been disclosed. And why is this important to have this right in these two directives? The thing is that uh, the right of access remains a fundamental aspect of data protection law in the EU. But why is that? Uh, for starters, it is explicitly mentioned in the right to data protection in the Chart of Fundamental Rights, which is a source of primary law in the EU, as I guess most, if not all of you already know. But on top of that, uh, the literature and case law, mostly in the private and public sectors, not including security, by the way, um, facilitate a plausible argument that the right of access may serve different purposes. First of all, it constitutes, uh, uh, it, it's considered as a tool that enables data subjects uh, to exercise more control over their data and as a vital safeguard against informational power asymmetries in an increasingly datafied society, as uh, René Mailleux and Jeff Auslos put it in a recent paper. It also enables uh, to monitor the lawfulness of the processing and also to take action where necessary. So it is kind of a prerequisite for the exercise of other rights. It is also a tool to enhance transparency and to monitor whether uh, remedies, data protection remedies uh, have been applied um, in respect to certain data protection violations. And it is also a tool for activism and for policy making and the uh, clear example of that is uh, the success stories of Schrems, who needs no introduction here, but just a little reminder that his uh, privacy campaigns started precisely with the exercise of the right of access. And an important point in relation to this uh, um, uh, uh, activism and policy making uh, aspect of the right of access is that it could be particularly effective when exercised in a collective effort. 
Also, the right of access is not only a tool to help redress informational power uh, uh, in security, but also uh, it can help uh, be an important component of the ecology of transparency. So all of that led me to think that, well, if we have this informational tool in a security, in security instruments as well, perhaps the right of access could also help mitigate information asymmetries in a security context, because as I was saying, all those purposes have been proven or as widely studied in a more general data protection context, but it's, let's say, underexplored in a security uh, field. So in a nutshell, the idea is that the right of access can be a way for citizens to follow the trail of invisible data having an impact on their lives as a result of uh, data processing activities in security. However, we cannot overlook the fact that the information empowerment in the shape of access rights may be fully or partially restricted in accordance to Article 15 of the Law Enforcement Directive. Also, the right of access has a limited scope in a security context, and as the law doesn't require the same level of transparency as in a more general data protection context. So just to give you an example, um, the law enforcement directive doesn't seem to grant individuals with the right to a copy of their personal data, which is something that is explicitly mentioned in the GDPR. And not only that, uh, since the directives are not directly applicable, there's some flexibility for states when transposing its provisions or their provisions into their national laws. So just to wrap up, while the information empowerment of data subjects in the shape of access rights can operate as a tool to watch the watchers, it is no silver bullet. We still need to see if it will serve all the purposes that I mentioned before, and also whether through the right of access, uh, the average citizen will be able to obtain meaningful information about uh, data-driven security practices. In other words, we still need to test the boundaries of the right of access in these two directives, but also other data subject rights, not only in, those two, in these two instruments, but in other instruments that apply in a security context, such that we can assess the reach of citizen empowerment in this field as well. And those uh, were my key findings in a nutshell. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Katrine. I think this was very interesting. And I see Hilke already rising a hand. <laughs> um, please, Hilke, go ahead. Well, I started with a question, and uh, I, I really appreciated this very much, Katrine. The first question I posed before, namely uh, about the right of indirect access, can you explain to me if this right to indirect access would be uh, helpful to your to, to solve the problem you raise? Thank you very much for that question. Um, I think that indeed uh, the indirect access, which is uh, something that I need to uh, address uh, in my paper uh, to make it more <laughs> complete, okay. let's say. <laughs> yeah, because you need to have the, fo the full picture. Yeah, that's, that's um, let's say, an alternative that the law enforcement directive um, considers um, uh, when, I mean, the first option, the, the, the initial option, the natural option is for you to directly exercise your rights. But um, when uh, the competent authorities uh, restrict your right to access, then you can um, exercise it through uh, uh, the data protection authorities. And I think it's, it's very, a very interesting um, aspect of the law enforcement directive that you can get, uh, let's say, the help of these uh, public bodies, these institutions, these su supervisory bodies to uh, help you check uh, whether uh, the competent authorities have done the right thing with your data, if their processing operations are lawful. I think um, it, it would be uh, yeah, a good element to, to explore. The, uh, the only thing is that I'm more um, concerned that Perhaps some in, in some countries, for example, before I was uh, attending a panel about the uh, data protection 
authorities uh, supervising the, the law enforcement framework. And it came to the to to the conversation that uh, in Belgium uh, the the indirect access that's actually the the only access that you can get. And I think that although that that's a good tool for us to get more informational empowerment uh, from from uh, controllers, I would perhaps uh, prefer to have the option also to go for direct access as well. Uh, which is what basically the law enforcement directive seems to 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 say. So you, you should have the two options uh, to be able to exercise your rights and to uh, obtain uh, the maximum information from from these competent authorities and security. Uh, thank you very much. I'm I'm not presiding this, but I found this very interesting. Also, the link because I think indeed uh, indirect. Access can be very useful, but it should not replace the, the main instrument, namely direct action. Played quite well. But uh, Francisca is sharing it, so mm -hmm. I don't say anything more. No, I'm, I'm fine if you ask questions, Hilke, because there are no questions in the chat so far. So if you have another one, please ask. Otherwise, I would also have one, as it's also. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I like to know because I'm. Access always has to do with the yeah, notification. So you need to know that your data are processed by law enforcement. And I mean, this is a tricky thing. A, a tricky thing. And I'm, I don't know, I'd like to know how you um, actually see this. Is there a right to notification that your data are being processed by law enforcement? Or is it a kind of yeah, thing which should um, exist or still exists? Um, so how do you see notification and the right of access? Yeah, that's actually uh, also a very interesting point. So thank you for that question. Um, the thing is that um, that's where the balance uh, between security and fundamental rights comes again into play. So it's true that sometimes uh, competent authorities need to uh, process data, need to conduct certain processing operations without uh, people necessarily knowing all the details because that could perhaps be uh, um, negative, let's say, have a negative impact on their own interests, security interests. But at the same time, we need to, I mean, there's a moment when those uh, restrictions need to stop and we are entitled to know uh, how our data were processed at, at the specific moment when it was necessary for the investigatory needs, uh, for example, of, of competent authorities for them to do their job, let's say. And yeah, at some point, I think, uh, when that's, uh, that investigation stops, uh, it's important uh, that the data subject is informed uh, duly and with, uh, yeah, that we receive this kind of information. And if we don't, for example, through the right of access, perhaps you uh, realize uh, by exercising the right of access that uh, you should have been informed of a certain moment when you were being, let's say, surveilled, for example, uh, in the context of a criminal investigation and never informed, I think that could be uh, an interesting uh, aspect to explore in this context as well. But we, we still need to see how this will come into play uh, because I, I think the right of access, it's um, an underexplored aspect, aspect of uh, the law enforcement directive. Uh, not only the right of access, but data subject rights in general are not something that uh, we hear a lot uh, so far. Uh, but I hope that from now, uh, I mean, there are, there's some research going on and I hope that it continues growing and that we can see, explore the different aspects uh, of this uh, data subject rights and other informational rights uh, in, in the law enforcement directive and other uh, security instruments as well. Okay, thank you. So now, as I said, um, uh, now we have three questions on the chat. So <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe I summarize them quickly and you answer very quickly because we, we like to announce the, the winner as well. So, but I try to summarize it. So the first question relates is um, to the, is the right of access um, very useful for a normal person? So for a normal person who might not know the details. And Mark Cole is asking, um, I was just going to ask you about direct and indirect access from the previous METIS panel, but you picked it up. But based on a recent research paper we published in EDPI, could the fight, um, could, the, could the right if used in a massive scale overburden the ones that have to give the information and um, thereby making it less effective? For example, because of time delays resulting um, from this. And Paul Breitenbach 
uh, to ask um, whether you have <laughs> to had a look at how the European approach to providing access differs from others approaches in other jurisdictions. So maybe you can, sorry for that, give a quick answer <laughs> to, you can choose to one or two of these questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for all your questions. Um, I will try to briefly say something about each of them. So the aspect of uh, getting uh, information from a normal person, that's actually one of my open questions at the end of the presentation. Like, do we really uh, will be normal citizens be able to have uh, actual meaningful information from data controllers? We don't know, but we still need to, that's why we need to test these things. We need to put it into practice and see how it operates and how, uh, what, we, what we can get uh, from this. And about the massive scale uh, and the problems with potential delays uh, that can arise from these exercises, I must say that I do believe uh, very much in the collective dimension of this uh, right, of the possibility of uh, increasing the, the impact that it could have and the, um, uh, the changes, the policy changes that we can get from the collective exercise. Yes, uh, certain institutions might be overburdened at some point, uh, but uh, this is something that we need to <laughs> see how to not, not to not to get to that point and not to uh, get them to put stress in the system because that's not uh, the purpose of, of these uh, initiatives. And the uh, right of access in other jurisdictions uh, other than the EU, I haven't had the opportunity to explore it, but I think that's a very interesting line of research that we could um, yeah, take into account for future uh, research. Thank you. Thank you um, to all of you three. I think it was very impressive and um, I think the public um, was also very involved. Thank you very much uh, for asking these questions and I would like to thank also to my jury colleagues uh, for reading all these papers. Um, and now I would hand over to Bart, um, our editor, um, to announce the winner and say some nice words about him or her. Right. Okay, well, um, can everyone hear me? Uh, yeah. I hope so. Okay. Um, so I this year I wasn't uh, part of the jury, but I was last years, um, and it's always a very exciting process. You get about thirty to fifty papers in, um, and first you make a selection of the ten best papers, and this is something that Francisca did, did this year, and this is already a very difficult task. Um, there are so many good submissions, and I, I saw them this year as, as well. They were almost all of outstanding quality. And so to make that decision of 10 is already a, a huge burden. And then the jury decides on which five papers of those 10 will be published in EDPL, an even harder task. And then the three persons to, um, to present at CPDP are selected, and then like the winner should be selected. And there's always a huge fight in, in the jury. Um, everyone has their own favorite. Everyone has valid arguments for each paper to win. And um, I, I, I was luckily not part of the jury this year. Uh, and I read the papers uh, and I'm very happy that I, I wasn't the person making the decision this year because um, each of them um, is so good. So first, I want to thank um, the jury of this year, uh, Alessandro, Francisca, Hugh, uh, of, of course, Gloria also is here, especially Francisca who chaired the whole, uh, whole thing. Um, so to the papers, for me, they were very interesting and, and all they touch upon a very specific and central element of data protection law. It's a your paper is very timely and the more I think about data protection law in general, the more I think it is a question of enforcement, it is a question of power relationship. Back to the beginning, the change from the data protection directive to the GDPR and now the, the proposals that, that, that appear for further um, um, re-adaption of, of, the, of the data protection model all in, in essence derive from the problems of enforcement and power. And your work um, furthering Orla's work, of course, um, and your analysis of the literature is very worthwhile reading. So uh, bravo on that, Tanner. 
view as well. I, I, I know the topic intimately because I worked on, on, on the notion of group privacy. And I think the genetic groups is something that is, sure, um, um, uh, is, is something that is, is, is really central to, to new um, questions of data protection law, because the genetic group is of course the most uh, sensitive one in a way, but the group as such is something that is becoming more determinative for how companies and states operate. So this is exactly a question that has a broader significance uh, in, in many respects. Um, so it, again, very, very interesting to read. And Catherine, uh, last but very certainly not least, the, the access model and, and the way you use the, the law enforcement directive and the PNR directive to kind of, of, of um, uh, shed light on, on, on the most basic of all rights in, in, in the data protection uh, uh, arena without access, without information. There is no rights, there is no control. And again, like the first paper, it is about um, it, it is about power essentially and, 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 and the way we as citizens can get power back, especially against these, these uh, powerful governmental organizations. So without further ado, because we're running out of time, um, I, I have to announce a winner, but I, I mean it seriously. It, it, it's always being said like um, there is one winner, but the others are, are not losers. But this time, this is very, very much true. So I will announce winner. I haven't picked it myself, um, uh, but I agree uh, I, actually. Um, and, and the winner is Tanner. Tanner, you you are the winner of uh, of the Young Scholar Award. Congratulations on that. Congratulations. Uh, Congratulations. Yeah. My um. Thank you so much. I don't know what to say. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> if you can carry on for a second, I can get back to myself. <laughs> sure, sure. So, so congratulations, and, and your paper is is really worthwhile reading. I think um, it has the level uh, which which holds true for the other uh, two papers as well of an academic, an, a junior academic, but really an academic paper. It's thorough, it's well, uh, well researched, um, and it's analytical level, it's really top notch. So um, um, I, I don't know whether you've sent it to, to Paul the Hurt and, and uh, Dara, etc., et but they should read your paper as, uh, as well, which holds true for the other two as well. I mean, you can be really proud of it, and you really are really on the level of an academic. So I hope that you will all work in academia, and, uh, do PhDs and become professors uh, uh, at one point. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you. If I may, can I take the floor for a second? Yes, please go ahead for the okay. last minute and then we can. Okay, um, well, first of all, thank you very much for this award. I'm still in shock and I'm truly <laughs> honored to receive this. And um, I would like to congratulate again my uh, fellow finalists because we were all from class 2020 and like we worked so hard throughout last year. And uh, it's a shame that we cannot celebrate this together this year, but uh, let's say in the future somehow we will come together to celebrate this. And um, lastly, I would like to thank to uh, ELO of Leiden University and my pro all my professors, separate specifically to Professor Leiser, my supervisor, throughout uh, his support throughout the uh, whole process. And if I may, um, I would like to. Okay, I'll stop here. <laughs> um, anyway, so I would like to thank to my partner for um, everything because I couldn't have achieved anything. So I dedicate this award uh, to you. Thank you. I think <laughs> I think now we we close this panel with a happy winner, and and we all thank you for um, yeah, watching and listening, and the, all your papers. Were so very thank you to EDPL as well for making this possible. Thank you. Bye. Bye.